Hello everyone. Good evening from Sydney, Australia, and good day to you from wherever in the world you are joining us. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third plenary session for the Health System Global Symposium. And the plenary is titled Engaging Technological Data and Social Innovations. The session will focus on the third sub-theme of the symposium of engaging technological data and social innovations. This plenary session will consider the interaction of rapid advances in new technologies and innovations with issues relating to equitable spread of such technologies across low resource settings and to low resource people. I am Shaya Bimbola and I will be the moderator for this session. I am a senior lecturer at the University of Sydney in Australia and I'm also the editor-in-chief of the journal BMJ Global. I study um, in my research life, I study decentralized governance and the role that governance plays in the adoption and scale up of health system innovation. For this session, we are going to have um, a keynote speaker um, followed by four panelists. But before we move on to that, I'll share a few uh, tips um, on using the platform. And I think the key tip to share is to make sure that you put your questions in the Q&A uh, segment of your screen uh, and not in on the discussion forum. Um, our first uh, keynote speaker is Eric Topol, who is a cardiologist at the Ships Translational Science Institute in the US. Eric is an American cardiologist, scientist, and author, and, and those who follow discussions on artificial intelligence and their role in health and healthcare will know very much about Dr. Topol's work. Um, right away, we will move on to um, Eric's uh, talk, which will be followed by the panel discussion. Hello, I'm Eric Topol, and I'm pleased to join the HSR 2020 6th Global Symposium on Health Systems Research. I also want to express a particular thanks to Dr. Robin Whitaker, who I get the chance to work with as a part-time faculty member of the University of Auckland. So artificial intelligence and healthcare, what are the global implications? First thing we want to address is that Medicine today as a practice is not precise, but even more importantly, it's not accurate enough. The problem we have is, uh, in the United States, for example, is a very substantial, over 25 million significant medical errors a year. And this obviously, just having precision medicine, which is the buzzword, isn't going to be fixed. We also need to enhance greatly accuracy. So neural nets, like our brain, artificial neurons, with inputs such as medical images or speech or text running through these artificial neurons for the deep neural network or deep learning is really a revolution that's ongoing in healthcare. It's in the early stages, but the outputs could get us much more accuracy and even well beyond that. <clears throat> Take, for example, a chest X-ray where a radiologist looks at it and misses a key finding that's picked up by an algorithm, a neural network that's trained by hundreds of thousands of chest X-rays to find nodules that could be cancerous, which this one proved to be. Or take another example of mammography, which has a very high incidence of false positives and also false negatives, but that accuracy markedly improved in this very large study at New York University. Uh, where machines can pick up things that expert radiologists miss. <clears throat> Perhaps the best example I can give about algorithmic training using deep neural networks is the retina. This picture of the retina, if we were to show it to the world's leading retinal authorities and ask them if it comes from a man or a woman, the answer would be, 50% right, 50% chance of getting it right. Whereas neural networks have been trained to have that accuracy of over 97%. Well, clearly we don't 
need to use deep neural networks of the retina to determine a person's gender. There are better ways to do that, but what it leads to is the sense of how much we can learn that we missed from the informative pattern of a retinal picture or any a scan or picture in medicine. This will allow us to track kidney disease, diabetes, blood pressure, the development and progression of Alzheimer's disease, and when to interrupt, uh, for example, in the course of macular degeneration. There are promising studies in all of these areas, and that's just the retina, which is really a gateway uh, to many parts of the functional human body. I've been a cardiologist for over three decades, and when I look at a cardiogram, which is one of the things I really enjoy to do, I can't tell whether it's from a man or a woman. Neural networks can. I can't tell if it's a person who has anemia, but certainly with hundreds of thousands and millions of cardiograms, that can be determined. What is the ejection fraction? Just looking at the 12-lead cardiogram or making difficult diagnoses such as amyloid, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or pulmonary hypertension quite accurately. <clears throat> this ability for seeing things, that is, picking up things by machines that are missed by expert clinicians, is also seen in pathology, where you look at a slide, tells you machine algorithm, what is the basis of the tumor, does it have structural genomic variations, what is the driver mutation of this cancer? All these things that can't be done, which is extraordinary, uh, that machine support can provide. So to sum up this process, as we get prospective rigorous studies that validate all these things, every single walk of life of healthcare professionals will be altered. There isn't any exception. And here's an example of a colonoscopy. Gastroenterologists have been leading this space in many respects. And now with machine vision, here this is from Japan, the ability to pick up polyps that are missed by the gastroenterologist with real-time machine vision, also determining whether that polyp is likely to be cancerous requiring a biopsy or not. This is the sort of thing that you could do, which just a few years ago would be unimaginable. It's also something across the entire health span, whether it's be picking embryos that are viable, high quality, that are now being done for decades with lots of issues of errors and uncertainties, all the way through being able to uh, provide an accurate prognosis for someone who enters the hospital, every step of the way across the health span. So this uh, Dr. DeLiva's uh, quote, machines will not replace physicians, but physicians using AI will soon replace those not using it, I think is apropos. We'll get into the global issues about that in just a moment. On the consumer patient side, it's important to note that we often talk about AI for doctors and nurses and clinicians, but equally important is the development of these tools to make patients more autonomous doctor-less, being able to pick up data they generate with an algorithmic support to make the beginning, the initial diagnosis. In this case, the first one in the United States was heart arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation from a smartwatch, getting FDA approval even a few years ago. And now many more are in the process, such as diagnosis of skin lesions for cancer or rashes or other skin abnormalities or a urinary tract infection. You can get AI kits in pharmacies in the UK and other countries that will diagnose whether or not you have a urinary tract infection. And uh, this is uh, highly accurate. So ultimately the individual through this sort of natural progression will have all their data processed and fed back to them to hopefully prevent an illness they were high risk to eventually manifest or better manage a condition they already have that's chronic. That's where we're headed over the long term. And this is software 
This is requiring not just deep learning models, but hybrid models. It will take time to get there, but we will get there. And this should be for those who are interested and also to share it with clinicians, a uh, very valuable support uh, mechanism. The AI tool that I uh, have become very enamored by is smartphone ultrasound because ultimately that can be transformative around the world. And it already has in some cases. This is the device I uh, use the most uh, with every patient I see in cardiology, the uh, smartphone ultrasound. The probe is connected to the base of the smartphone and immediately with a little gel on the probe, imaging can start. And this is the heart and you can see everything of the heart in seconds and share it directly with the patient the strength of the heart muscle, the thickness of the heart muscle, the size of the cavities, chambers, the valves. And you can even see whether the valve is leaking, how severe is the leak, all within seconds, in different views. And so this led me to want to take pictures of medical self in my entire body. Here are the carotids, the sinuses, the thyroid, liver, kidney, gallbladder, iliac artery, spleen, aorta, in fear of being a cave of popliteal fossa, even my left foot, all within minutes. This is a very powerful tool. And what's more impressive is that now with AI, it can be guided with a person who doesn't even know how to do the images, where it will, once put on the body in the general vicinity, it will instruct the person to move the probe counterclockwise or clockwise up or down and get images and get the labeling of the images and interpretation, providing the ejection fraction, the size of the chambers, all with AI, so that anyone eventually will be able to use this on virtually any part of their body except the brain with a smartphone. And that's a pretty exciting direction. That's why you see in places like Africa and India, the ability to use smartphone ultrasound to diagnose pneumonia and other conditions. That's just getting started now. But this is an example of a global impact with the use of AI tools and digital medicine. But there are downsides. Of course, the privacy issues have to be addressed. We have to come up with ways to ensure fairness and not worsen inequities, but in fact, reduce inequities, which just has the power to provide. So this is an area that is tremendously important, which is to make sure that this two-edged sword of improving accuracy and giving more autonomy, leveling the, the earth in terms of many capabilities on the planet is not compromised by all these potential downsides. 12 different algorithms of racial bias were reviewed in this June New England Journal study paper. And the point is, is that we have embedded bias. We have systemic racism and we can't expect the algorithms to fix that, but we need to be totally aware and preempt that when these deep learning, deep neural networks are developed. This is a critical matter because otherwise we just carry over the biases that we have into the development of AI uh, algorithms. And we also know that we can reduce inequities by transfer learning, that is, by taking uh, the algorithms and reducing intentionally data, uh, the inequity as it applies to population. So there is use of AI to reduce inequities and bias, just as there is use of AI for most of the problems that it can create. It also can provide a potential solution. One of the things that I'm excited about is in the field of AI, unlike in medical research in general, where it took over 20 years to get to the standards of protocols and reporting dissemination. Just last month in September, there were multiple publications. I wrote the editorial in Nature Medicine, but British Medical Journal and The Lancet for these standards that were developed by the Delphi uh, methods and rigorous assessment by international uh, group of experts. So we have the standards now and they need to be applied. Now, just to sum up, there are no algorithm for empathy. 
and this is the more far-reaching capability of AI, is to foster the human bond. We can do these protocols and do these trials and have prospective trials, which is great. And we need to improve the accuracy by rigorous studies. And these the limited number of prospective trials here. You see in just six different or disciplines of medicine, and even less so with deep neural networks, randomized trials, where most of them are colonoscopy or endoscopy, and only one uh, is outside of China so far. So the goal of the future is better care of the patient. We can get to accuracy, but what we really need is the human bond, the ability to take the streamlining, the efficiency, the getting more patient autonomy, getting the data all teed up for the clinician so they don't have to spend so much time going through screens and pages of data. It's all set so that we make and prioritize the bond between patients and their doctors. This is what's been missing. This is what's been eroding over decades. And Francis Peabody, what, almost uh, 90 plus years ago, wrote a classic paper in the JAMA and I won't it's a six page paper which I strongly recommend if you haven't read it to read it and the conclusion is one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient so I want to leave you with this that the greatest gift we can do with AI worldwide is to restore the precious patient clinician relationship. It's even more far reaching than improving accuracy and it's distributed everywhere because it's not any place in the world where there hasn't been a burnout of clinicians, global crisis, and there hasn't been patients that feel that there's not the empathy, compassion, time, the gift of time and communication. So hopefully we'll see that in the future. So thanks so much for your attention and I wish uh, you a very successful uh, symposium. So now that we've listened to the uh, keynote speaker, Eric Topol. We will now move on to the um, panel discussion. And first we will um, hear from our four panelists, um, Dr. Claudia Hagilari, who is the director of the Global eHealth Program at the University of Edinburgh and co-lead of the NHS Digital Academy. She's also an advisor in digital health ethics for the Scottish government and a member of the WHO roster of experts in digital health. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Pratap Kumar, who is a physician with a PhD in neuroinformatics, a health economist, and a social entrepreneur. He is a senior lecturer at the Strathmore Business School in Nairobi, Kenya, working on innovation and entrepreneurship in global health. He is also the founder of Health Enet, a digital health startup which combines innovations across mobile technology, clinical processes, and business models to improve healthcare services in low resource settings. He is currently the PI of an NIH grant under the Blood Safe Program, exploring innovative approaches to improve access to safe blood in Africa. Our third panelist is Dr. Dari Alhuwel, who is an ass assistant professor at Kuwait University, a fellow of the American Medical Informatics Association, a member of the WHO Digital Health Technical Advisory Group, and serves as a health informatics consultant at Dasman Diabetes Institute, where he co-founded the Health Informatics Unit. His research involves examining digital health adoption, consumer engagement, and empowerment. And our fourth and last panelist is Dr. Robin Whitaker, who is a public health physician and associate professor at the National Institute for Health Innovation, University of Auckland, New Zealand. Robin is a clinical director of innovation at local health service, at the local health service. Her research involves the development and evaluation of M health interventions in New Zealand, the Pacific region, and supporting the WHO globally. 
So now um, we will start by listening first to Dr. Claudia Pagillari, our first panelist. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed listening to Dr. Topol's presentation and uh, we are uh, in this panel considering uh, these issues around AI uh, uh, in reflection of his presentation and also our views on the low and middle income country context and other types of low resource settings. Um, but more generally, I'd like to um, uh, comment first of all on the concept of AI. It, the term is used a great deal nowadays. Uh, there is almost a, an evangelism uh, and magical thinking around AI. It's often being applied to many things that are not in fact AI. They are other types of uh, data processing uh, uh, and uh, other types of robotic process automation, for example. And I think we need to be very clear about this um, in our conversations moving forward about what is going to be helpful or otherwise. Um, it's really important to separate the methods of AI uh, from the applications. So the methodologies are the different forms of data mining and processing, uh, some using uh, uh, artificial neural network uh, uh, methods and deep learning. Um, and those are separate from the tools that it might yield. Uh, for example, a, a, a self-learning uh, diagnostic tool, for example, that is it's constantly learning from the data inputs and outputs, um, as opposed to perhaps a chatbot, which is based on a more simple algorithm, a question answering service, for example. Um, and uh, uh, so this is it's important to, that we have, uh, we move towards a consensus on a classification system to inform our discussions moving forward. I'd next like to uh, come to the issue of value and benefits from these technologies. Uh, Professor uh, Topol uh, uh, successfully illustrated a number of examples where this can be helpful. He mainly focused on diagnostic and clinical use cases of AI, however. But there are other types of use cases that are being explored in this context, such as public health, and the um, value proposition for these uh, will vary. It's likely um, that the different types of data are being used um, for uh, at different levels of scale, for example, to inform algorithms. The purposes of artificial intelligence uh, applications may be slightly different. They may be predicting things for populations, not just for individual patients. And this has a number of uh, implications. Related to this, um, I'd like to examine, uh, or I think we should examine, how the benefits of AI are being framed by different players in this landscape. Um, as I said, it's a very popular topic at the moment. There's a great deal of investment going into it. And the benefits are being framed slightly differently by technologists, researchers, biomedical businesses, clinical experts, uh, and governments, as I mentioned, public health agencies, for example. Professor Topol also acknowledged that AI has potential to introduce or exacerbate biases and inequalities, as well as to reduce them. And this brings us to the questions of value and ethics when it comes to these, to these technologies. He's correct about those biases, um, and uh, some of those are intentional uh, biases. Some of them are biases resulting from data. Uh, for example, uh, he pointed to uh, a retinal screening example, I, I believe. Um, and uh, we, we certainly, he also referred to the fact that in some countries there may be entrenched uh, racism uh, that is falling, it is finding its way into algorithms. In, on the other hand, we are seeing data-driven biases, for example, uh, chatbots, which will produce a different output for men and for women using the same input, uh, the same symptoms. 
And in these cases, we often are able to trace that back to the research uh, evidence that is informing the data, which is driving the algorithm. So we really need to unpack this uh, and recognize that these are data-driven problems to some extent. And in low and middle income countries, poor data quality is a major issue. Um, and likewise, that's the case even in, in high income countries. So this will be a challenge going forward if we want to produce sufficiently precise uh, and useful AI uh, tools for diagnosis or for other aspects of care. On the concept of ethics, though, there are a number of other ethical challenges, which, which uh, Professor Topol uh, didn't touch on, although I'm, I'm sure he's aware of them. And these include, uh, uh, well, one of the most important ones is the power differentials in the control of these technologies. Um, uh, who, who is in charge? Who is applying these things? Uh, who has the, uh, the power to distribute them to different countries? Who is making the decisions about what goes into them? Who is able to use the outputs from them? There are also a um, you know, great deal of uh, variations, as I said, in how these things are applied, which have other implications. It's important to consider how responsible the users of predictive insights are as well, because when we have AI and we're able to predict things, uh, are we going to be in a position where the clinician uh, or indeed some technology company knows more about your health future than you do? Are they going to share that with you or could they potentially share that with an insurance company, for example, which could minimize your care or, or, uh, or bounce you from their lists, for example? Um, so these are ethical issues we are still to fully, fully uh, engage with. Uh, Professor Toffel describes a world of enlightened, empathic, patient-centered clinicians. And this is very important. We can indeed, as he said, maybe release time for clinicians to, to concentrate on the, that human bond, as he mentioned it. However, I've, I've already noted the actors in medical AI are far more diverse than this. And indeed, decisions about how to deploy AI can reflect political considerations or vested interests, such as rationing care or selling more drugs. It's true, though, that these automating some of these administrative screening and diagnostic processes can leave clinicians potentially less stressed and freer to concentrate on their patient relationships. But we do know from other types of automation that it can simply increase throughput uh, so you may not have as much time uh, to spend with your patient, you may be just getting more of them. It can also have potential to de-skill professions or replace staff. This is why we need responsible managers. They're often neglected in, the, in discussions about health informatics. We need responsible managers to recognize the value of empathic human contact time. For example, a previous research in telehealth care suggests that while technology may give the illusion that care can be provided by any eligible doctor with the right skills in a practice, actually by, by distributing it in this random way, you may lose the value of continuity of care, which has this human bond and also is able to rely on stored memory. The world, as we know, isn't isn't as global as we would like it to be. Global implies that we are all doing things to a similar, in a similar way, that there is this joint sort of sharing of knowledge and skills and capacity, but we know life isn't like that, sadly. It's nice to imagine a future in which technologies like AI have started to iron out global and national inequalities through automation and augmentation of services. And certainly some good examples are emerging. But nations still differ in their resources to pay for these technologies, the data available to generate or customize them, and in their ability to control how their citizens' information is used. Whether AI will empower lower income countries and globalize or democratize healthcare, or with whether it will further entrench existing power imbalances, partly depends on how successful we are in defining expectations and regulations now. And finally, I would point to the need for more regulatory innovation in LMIC, uh, where there, in many cases there are not such strong uh, systems of governance. Um, and, but these are critical if we're going to use these technologies fairly. 
And uh, that's all I would like to say at this point and hand over to my colleagues. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pratap and I um, would like to pick up today on one of the points that Eric made and do something of a yes and. And so the technology or the part of the talk I'd like to pick up on is mobile ultrasound technology that Eric highlighted as potentially being transformative across the globe. The context in Africa is clearly that there are very few doctors uh, and skilled medical professionals. And so we've been using this technology of mobile ultrasound to overcome these challenges. And so from this specific experience, I'd like to make three points. First, that AI needs to work not just with physicians, but many other carters. Second is there's not just the AI that needs to be developed, but many other processes around the uh, AI itself. And lastly, I'd like to highlight one big downside of this technology that we should all be concerned about. So the largest cadre of healthcare professionals in Africa is nurses. So we've been training nurses to use these mobile probes. And the training lasts about a month. They then visit a primary health center where uh, antenatal care is delivered close to where women live. Scans done by nurses are shared with a sonographer who receives a link to the scan, reviews the images, and provides a report that goes back to the nurse and back to the pregnant woman by a simple SMS. And so this is broadly how it works. Uh, this is the scan being done by the nurse on a browser, on a tablet. Uh, the sonographer clicks on a link received by SMS and accesses a browser-based reporting tool. And then this is the report that gets sent back to the patient, uh, to the pregnant woman, also by uh, SMS. So we have done over 2,000 scans to date. Uh, and you can see how we've been scanning throughout, throughout the pandemic, barring a one lockdown month of April. The modal time to scan by a nurse is about 40 minutes. The modal reporting time is about three hours. Uh, we can tell a lot about the pregnancy from these scans, but we can also tell about how well nurses are performing on these scans with respect to what sonographers and other experienced professionals expect. So from this use of mobile ultrasound, on the left is a rough list of different people involved and their goals. And on the right, some possible uses of AI to achieve these goals. So for example, we can use AI to improve, to help improve how nurses or even lay people get images, or, uh, pick up images on ultrasound. We could use AI to det automatically detect fetal parameters uh, to make reporting faster and more accurate. We could use AI to flag potential complications missed by a nurse or sonographer and highlight this to a radiologist. We could combine imaging data with other antenatal care information to predict risk in pregnancy. We could combine this information with resource availability for better referral. Uh, but the point I'd like to make is that each of these are distinct algorithms which will need to be developed and will need to work with and for different people. So here are some of the key takeaways. Uh, so the first, is that for AI to impact global health, it needs to be inclusive, right? but this will require a lot of work. Second, it's not just algorithms that need to be developed, but also clinical workflows and business models that are effective and sustainable. And this will only happen if there are more local actors involved. And to put it bluntly, an algorithm developed in, Sil in Silicon Valley will only have an impact on global health if it works with and for local systems. And entrepreneurs are probably best placed to make this happen. And third, the best algorithms for Kenya, for example, are going to be built on data from Kenya. And I think we should all be committing to something like this. So the last point I'd like to make is about a downside of widespread use of ultrasound that is in plain view. So we're moving rapidly from ultrasounds that look like this on the left to a probe that fits in one pocket, a monitor that fits in the other pocket, and AI that lives in the ether. And we know what happened when or with widespread use of these big machines. And the main weapon to counter misuse of ultrasound has been regulation. And this is not going to work with a probe that fits in one pocket 
and AI that allows almost anyone to determine fetal sex. So as a community, the question is, what are we going to do? So thank you. I'm going to leave it there and look forward to great discussion. Great. Uh, I'm humbled and honored to be amongst uh, a great uh, group of panelists. Uh, hopefully you can all see my uh, screen and my slides clearly. Uh, uh, but, you know, having to talk about, uh, you know, AI and global health is such a such an exciting topic, especially uh, uh, nowadays. And trying to follow up on the great uh, talk by Professor Topol and, you know, the great colleagues uh, that preceded me, uh, let me try to decipher uh, some of this, at least in my humble point of view. So we're, we're all thinking about this uh, digital wave uh, that's, that's upon us. And, and sometimes maybe even thinking about this as a tsunami uh, uh, that's really uh, uh, coming uh, uh, ahead of us. Uh, and you know, whether we, we like it or not, uh, you know, it, it's here and, and likely here to stay. Uh, but I think, you know, as, as some of my colleagues uh, earlier uh, alluded to, uh, I think training the workforce on how to best leverage AI, especially in, in low and middle, middle income countries, I think is, is very important, whether that's on the job training or looking at integrating some of these uh, tools, technologies and techniques uh, like AI into our curriculums. Uh, so I'll give you a very humble example. In the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, uh, uh, you know, where, where, I'm, where I'm from, uh, if you look at the number of programs, uh, academic programs uh, or, or higher education programs that have uh, components of digital health integrated in them, they're gonna find them very few. Uh, you know, we're not fortunate uh, to have, you know, academies such as the NHS Digital Academy, as an example, right, being integrated into uh, the workforce development. So there are a lot of challenges, but we need to also start thinking about how we can introduce those, uh, uh, if you will, trainings on how to best leverage, understand and use AI within, uh, uh, you know, the, the healthcare workforce. But I think also interestingly, uh, you know, is it time for us to also integrate uh, uh, you know, the, the teaching of AI, what it is and how to use it within the general health uh, curriculums and courses that we provide in you know, primary schools and secondary schools and start integrating that. We have a digitally, uh, if you will, informed uh, uh, generation that's growing up and coming. And I'm wondering if it's that, if now is the appropriate time to start you know, also uh, uh, looking at this and, and trying to integrate this. Uh, you know, also this was mentioned earlier, but, you know, sustainability of business models, you know, whether, you know, we have, who's going to be controlling uh, some of these, uh, if you will, technologies, tools, techniques, or, 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 you know, simply put, you know, for a lot of uh, LMICs, you know, products that they're, they're going to buy off the shelf. Oftentimes in low resource settings, the power, there, there is a power struggle and a power dynamic that, you know, usually happens. So who has the upper hand uh, when, it comes to the, when it comes to this? But partnering with local and developing the local talent is, is super uh, important uh, when it comes to uh, uh, trying to leverage, uh, you know, uh, these, these uh, tools, technologies and techniques, because otherwise it's just going to be reliant uh, uh, on, you know, uh, quotes and quotes, uh, uh, Silicon Valley uh, 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 types of algorithms or technologies, and that's definitely not going to be appropriate or uh, work uh, in, in LMIC settings. When it comes to challenges, unfortunately, there are many, many challenges that have been highlighted by all the speakers that preceded me. Uh, but very importantly, uh, I guess, you know, maybe in the context that I'm in, and, you know, a lot of times that I think in, uh, you know, we have a lot bit major issues when it comes to having uh, a proper uh, uh, data available that is of high quality that can actually be used and leveraged uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, you know, how are these, how is AI integrated within the broader health ecosystem uh, of the health systems that we have in general, right? Let alone the cultural barriers, you know, sometimes, you know, the, the ability to predict one's illness or one's health is considered forbidden uh, in, in certain cultures. So how are we going to, you know, best leverage that, but also, you know, being respectful of people's cultures and people's uh, backgrounds. 
But also, you know, there is a major challenge that is not only applicable to uh, low resource settings, and that's the non-standardized mechanisms to evaluate the performance, the impact, and the output of these uh, artificial intelligence algorithms and tools and what they'll be producing. Uh, and I'll leave you with this uh, uh, quote here uh, that I believe in, that technology and digital tools are only enablers for safer and higher quality of care. Co-creation of these tools must be from consumers and frontline staff from all levels, and that's from within uh, the context and from within the culture. Thank you. Great, thanks. Darian, kia ora koutou from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, my name is Robin Whitaker, uh, and as always, I really enjoy listening to uh, Professor Topol's talks. Uh, but I want to take a slightly different tack. Uh, so while we are uh, currently looking at implementing a, an AI lab within our health sector uh, in New Zealand, uh, I'm always really, um, so we're grappling with a lot of these issues at the moment, but I'm just always find it really strange that we jump immediately to some of the most difficult and risky things uh, when we're looking for help from AI. So, you know, diagnosis um, and the triage and, you know, treatment is uh, some of the most risky stuff that we do in medicine, where actually there's the ability to make huge gains, I think, from um, some of the less risky areas that AI could be really helpful in around uh, organizational and administrative processes within our health systems, for example, but also in the area that I'm really interested in, which is the consumer use. Uh, so how we can actually get some of these tools and assistance and information into the hands of people everywhere through their mobile phones. And so I wanted to um, draw on some of the lessons from the work that we've done taking mobile phone-based health interventions to people wherever they are. Uh, some of the promise and some of the pitfalls there because I think it's it's very much aligned because the promise both for for getting AI into people's hands uh, still will rely on the use of mobile phones because uh, the world has prioritized mobile phones and mobile communications technologies over everything else it is the fastest you know most rapid uptake of any technology in our history and the developing world low and middle income countries now are the areas that really are prioritizing uh, um, mobile phone communications technologies over any other technology. It's, it's where there is nothing else and it's where there are no health systems. Um, so it is the way to try and um, to reduce some of the inequities in access because almost everywhere in the world there is mobile communications technologies. And even where we, uh, even in developed countries, uh, in low resourced families and households, they are the ones who are prioritizing the use of a smartphone over anything else that they're spending their money on. So uh, even within countries, it is the way to reach people. Uh, and it works really well. We have really good evidence that we can reach people through mobile phones to, to, to work on, as, as Eric said, uh, to go into the areas of prevention and self-management of long-term conditions. Uh, you know, that this is the way that we're going to do it. And, and it is being used at the moment for all those reasons, to reach into populations that don't currently have good access, to make things more accessible, uh, and also to put people at the center, put them in control of their own health care. But uh, what we've learned is that there are, that was the promise, you know, that there are a whole lot of pitfalls, and the pitfalls are really in the long-term implementation. Uh, so while the promise is definitely there, uh, we come across these issues all the time when we're trying to implement in low and middle income countries uh, um, and in low resource settings. Uh, so I've been involved in trying to implement uh, M Health in a lot of different places around the world. And these are some of the issues that we continually come up against and, and they're no different you know, with AI and with, with different types of technologies. Uh, there are always going to be issues around who's gonna pay for this. Uh, technology. It's not just the access, actually, it's, it's also the confidence in using technology. So we find that within the population, there are groups who just don't have the confidence or the digital literacy to use a lot of these tools. And we need to do quite a lot of work around that. Um, but, the, but things get out of date very quickly as well. And we need to make sure that, that they are kept up to date. So often 
uh, when we when we're going into somewhere that's not our country and implementing something new, a new technology, then the people who have implemented it will leave, and uh, the content is not kept up to date, and that gets out of date very quickly. Uh, and there's um, we've often come across this issue of actually what we've ended up doing is putting a burden on the providers in that country that they can't actually live up to because they haven't had the capability uh, and the capacity to actually look after that technology uh, if they haven't been involved in developing it from the very beginning. And so uh, one of the biggest issues that we've all talked about is it not getting to the right people and actually increasing the, the gap and in the inequities. Uh, and even some of the very simple uh, technologies, um, we, we find that, um, that in different contexts, it can be a crowded space for a different reason. So, uh, for example, in a lot of these countries, uh, it's, it's quite uh, allowable to send spam by mobile phones. And then all of a sudden, uh, uh, what you can send by mobile phone is crowded out by a whole lot of advertising. Uh, and it doesn't make your health programs stand out. Um, so uh, I guess, uh, so these are kind of some of our um, key takeaways around successful implementation um, that are really just headings that could apply to anything. But uh, these are some of the, the key takeaways for us that we need to we need to have the evidence. And of course, with AI, this is only just building but we need to provide the good stories based on evidence, not just for the funders, but particularly as well for the health services and the clinicians who need to be the champions of these types of technologies and the uses for them. Uh, and if we can't provide them a good evidence-based story, it's very hard to get people on side uh, to promoting the use of the technologies. Uh, we have to have the locals, we have to have the right people in the room from the beginning. And this has been a really good lesson from the WHO uh, and their M Health toolkits uh, have very good description of, of who are all the right stakeholders. But if and they're very good at not actually starting until they're quite sure that they've got all the right people in the room from the very beginning. And that includes all of those who are going to be responsible for the infrastructure behind what you're doing, the, the telcos, the, the data and the health information systems, but also the people who are in the health system who are going to be actually promoting the use of these, who are going to have real in-person programs that are supporting these alongside them and then your champions and your promoters uh, they all have to be involved in building it so that it is fit for context I think this is the real key that that they have to be built fit for context and the most important in terms of the context is the people it has to be something that they want you know we have built um, a mobile phone based you know really simple programs for for people, for example, around smoking cessation and implemented them and then discovered that the people that have given it to didn't never actually wanted to give up smoking. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've got to build what people want and it has to be relevant for them. It's, it's quite an involved process that we go through to culturally adapt something for another context. Um, and that includes uh, how they use the technology in their culture, uh, their relationship with their technology, as well as the actual content and what's in there. Uh, all has to be culturally adapted for your population. And uh, this is the same with um, AI, it has to be tested on the on your population, it has to be tested with your population data to make sure that it is going to be relevant and there's not something in the context that means that it ends up having those unintended consequences as Pratap has, has talked about. And it also has to fit with local policies and local regulatory environments as well, particularly around the use of data and data protections, privacy, security, but also around accountability, one of the big issues with AI, uh, who is going to be accountable for the decisions that are made that are assisted by, by AI is one of the big issues and that will does change from context to context. Uh, and as we've, we've all um, focused on, uh, that these things really need to be built with and for those who need it most. And that what we've found uh, in our work is that if we build something very much initially designed and focused with those who need it most in a country, then it will work for everyone. Uh, but if we design it for only those who, who can easily access it and understand it and use it and interpret it, uh, then we're going to miss the, the, the um, potential promise of the technology in the first place. And it won't get us what we need. Um, so, and particularly with AI, I think the, 
the um, the equity and also the ethical questions around is it is it the right thing to use in this context? Do we need to use AI in this context? And is it the right thing to use for those who need it most? Is a really a good question that we need to ask ourselves when we're starting out. Uh, and if we if we can do all of those, then we'll build something that is able to be scaled. But if we don't consider these uh, success factors, then we're likely to build something that will never be scaled, uh, particularly in low resource settings. Uh, so that's just a kind of a summary of some of our key success factors in working in some of these countries uh, with introducing new technologies. So I, I'm going to stop there and I'll just uh, hand it back to Shay at this point. Great, thank you very much to our panelists and, and to the keynote speaker. Um, very interesting questions have been coming in, uh, but before we, we go uh, to the question and answer session, I will just quickly do a, 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 my reflections on, on what I've heard from Eric and from the four panelists. Um, I, and I've sort of classified them into three sets of themes. Um, the first one is that there's a sense of inevitability to, to these innovations, AI or, or whatever else, that they come uh, and they come with a certain kind of force. Uh, and whether we like it or not, they are going to spread, they're going to be used. Um, and the question is, how do we use them deliberately? How, how do we do that with, with careful thought? Uh, uh, it's, it's going to be a big question. The second um, uh, theme that I picked up fr from the discussion so far is the sense that technological innovations come with their own logic and they are going to govern our lives uh, and, um, and our efforts to govern them will, will butt heads <laughs> with, with their um, insistence on, on governing us. And again, the question there is how, how can we be careful and deliberate in, in how we go about using and adopting and scaling them? And the third um, theme that I've picked up is this sense that these innovations will not solve our most fundamental social problems. That they, that they, in fact, if anything, they're likely to exacerbate them. So they will solve some problems, but they will likely not solve the biggest problems. And for me, the big, the big question with attention is to what extent do we need to match our thinking about these innovations very carefully and, and from the start with thinking about accompanying social innovations. Right? So that we were thinking of adopting AI, we, are, we, we would adopt it, for example, without this particular set of innovations that would match them. Um, otherwise, again, we are likely going to run into these issues that have been raised so far. So altogether, very positive, I think, and very promising, but, but as with everything new, um, requires um, careful thought and, and deliberate uh, steps. And I'll just throw one set of questions to the, to the panelists uh, and I'll give them one minute and 30 seconds to answer them. <laughs> and, and, and this question is, uh, what briefly, what social innovation um, will you insist on before adopting and scaling up um, AI technology or any other technology that you want to talk about? So I'll start again um, with uh, Claudia and we'll go around. Thank you. What social innovation would I insist on? Um, I think uh, one place to start is giving patients more power and control over their own information or the information about them. Because uh, following the principle of um, nothing about me uh, without me, is really important here. If we don't know what data are being used uh, by other parties, what, uh, what algorithms mean in terms of our own information, then it can leave us disempowered and it also leaves room for further digital inequalities as those who know everything about everything uh, have, uh, have greater uh, power and those who are left behind have less. So that would be my number one message, more information, information sharing, and also um, development of knowledge and capacity on the part of the patient themselves. Great, thank you. Next, Pratap. 
Uh, thanks, Shay, uh, and thanks to everyone for great talks. Um, so um, I would focus on uh, two approaches. One is to make, uh, in the spirit of inclusivity, it's not just about including everyone, which is important, but it's also in including every type of workflow. And what I've been championing for the last few years is the idea that paper is really important and needs to come into the digital health space. So we can't ignore workflows and processes that happen using paper. So that's my um, uh, one take to say, uh, we need to keep the space as inclusive as possible, not exclude people because they don't have a device. And uh, paper happens to be one of those levelers, everybody uses it. So let's try and bring that as much as possible uh, without trying to say paperless is the, uh, is the only way to go. Uh, and the corollary to that is that it should work with everyone with their own capacities and their own abilities and their infrastructure. And so um, building on, I would say you need to work on a bring your own device approach that everybody should be able to bring their, what they have onto the table, as opposed to saying you need this technology for, you to, uh, for this to work for you. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dari, next. Uh, so uh, thank you for, for you know, uh, uh, this great uh, discussions. And I, I don't know if it's easier for me because the, the previous uh, panelists already laid uh, the ground. So I'm going to really echo what they uh, uh, fantastically said. Uh, but if I may add, also we need to think about the, the health system or the, eco the, the, the general broader ecosystem around this. So, uh, uh, you know, it's not enough that we empower uh, um, our patients, it's not enough that we empower our workflows uh, or uh, the workforce, but also we need to look at the supporting uh, pillars for that. So, you know, we look around the world and what kind of, uh, if you will, rules, uh, laws or regulations do we have in place either to push us forward or sometimes unfortunately to bar us from, you know, going uh, uh, forward. So I, I'm thinking, you know, uh, the social innovation, it really, it needs to come like a sandwich effect. So from top up, but also from bottom up and, and really uh, look at, you know, uh, the regulations uh, uh, as well as, you know, seeing how we can uh, prepare and empower everybody. So one thing, and this might be just a very wild idea, right? But in, in our health education, are we really uh, targeting, uh, you know, the youngsters? And now we are talking about artificial intelligence or we're talking about digital health within our healthcare curriculums. I think this might be the time and this will make it easier moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. And Robin? Well, everyone's already stolen the thunder, but um, but yeah, so I'll just go one kind of step further and say, you know, wouldn't it be great if we made all this technology free for health use? You know, if um, if we took the, the, it to the limit of, of making, you know, web, health websites completely whitelisted and free and um, mobile programs free for people and the, the technologies and the devices that would allow people to actually fully make the most of all of these options uh, so that uh, it will really be inclusive and available for all. But of course, not, not, it's not that it's one thing that um, will suit everyone as well. We need to have options, different options of the way I think these things are delivered uh, so that everyone can find something that suits them. Uh, and I guess just one other thought would be about the bias. You know, if, if we can, uh, if we can come up with a social innovation that uh, gets rid of the bias, that would, uh, so I'm being quite aspirational. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the questions I've been, I've been pouring in and, and um, they, they seem to speak to sort of different sets of things. And I will start from where we haven't touched on at all in, in these uh, talks and responses so far. And that is the area of cost effectiveness, right? So, so two questions, one from Pascal Alote and another from Zia Sotana. Um, and the question is, for example, the ultrasound um, innovation that Pratap spoke of, spoke of and, and Eric also mentioned, um, is it cost effectiveness to, to use these technologies as it is now? Uh, and Pascal's question was about, uh, given all the competing demands in the health system and in the social sector, 
Um, to what extent should governments pay attention in terms of financing to this new technology? A sort of continuation of the same question, right? Is it cost effective? Should we divert resources to it and how should we make decisions? Whoever wants to go first. I can come in there uh, if you like. It's, I think it depends on where you're sitting uh, and at what stage of development your um, country is or your uh, health system is and your technology sector, in fact. If there, there is a lot of talk about all the money that will be saved by AI and certainly in some American hospitals and, and others, so there has been money saved in certain things that are uh, labor intensive and not that good a use of people's time, for example. Um, and also we have potential to kind of add virtual money in, in low resource settings where there are, there are very few doctors and you can uh, kind of augment people's abilities using AI assisted technology. So there's a kind of economic benefit. But our challenge is right now that a lot of the hype around AI is coming from the very industries that are set to profit from this. And we need to be very careful when we're evaluating those uh, arguments uh, that we are not simply buying into this, uh, this, um, this vision that, that may not actually uh, serve us as well as it serves them. So I think that that would be an important question to raise. And finally, um, just to point out that in, in high resource uh, countries, there's a huge amount of investment investment going in from governments as well in developing all of this to such an extent that some uh, some analysts have said hang on a minute maybe you should be spending some of that money on basic health care rather than cutting back services so we face constant dilemmas and yes maybe in the future we will have a, a much more of a cost-effective outcomes right now mm, it's it's a bit iffy and it very much depends on the use case um, uh, sure. Um, so I, uh, I guess like all health economists would say cost effectiveness, effectiveness is going to be measured or it's important to take perspective into account. And so the perspective I'd like to take into account is um, the scale of access. Right? With this one technology of mobile ultrasound, it's never been possible for so many more people to access uh, key diagnostic tools like a fetal ultrasound. Uh, in pregnancy. And so now with these mobile probes, it's possible uh, to have scans done in the most remote settings uh, that exist. Um, so uh, the upside is obviously the number of sc uh, scans you can do and potentially the number of um, uh, mothers and babies lives that can be saved because of early detection of um, either fetal issues or at least fetal parameters. Um, uh, but the flip side is obviously uh, what I pointed out. So as a society, what price are we going to pay if um, large scale sex selection becomes uh, possible and becomes, um, uh, becomes used, right? And so uh, we have to take those perspectives into account to be able to measure both benefits and costs of such technologies. So this is not a technical problem or a technological problem or even a price problem because uh, the price of these scans, uh, we want to have a price point of uh, $15 per scan, including the nurse time, including sonographer time, including technology time, processes, insurance, and all that. Um, uh, so the cost is not the issue. So the issue is really the, um, the societal scale of both benefits and consequences. Yeah, and if I, if, you, I, if, I, yeah, yeah. if I may, Jay, uh, so, so I think also, uh, uh, and, and this is probably maybe from my humble experience. So oftentimes it's very difficult and hard to tell people I'm going to save you money, right? If you invest in this technology versus no, but we can build this clinic and, you know, there is a brick and mortar type of setting and you can actually physically go and visit this clinic or, you know, uh, uh, or what have you. But oftentimes, especially with, uh, uh, digital uh, uh, tools or, or digital technologies, it's oftentimes, it's, it's very difficult to see, uh, if you will, the long run. And this may not be necessarily confined only to the healthcare sector, uh, but I think uh, it will, uh, you know, being hopeful, I think it will only get better. Uh, and this is the role of, of science and, and scientists in terms of, you know, 
uh, making these uh, uh, studies and publishing the evidence and sharing it uh, 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 in different contexts. And, and, you know, I need to highlight that, you know, very carefully because, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, demonstrated by the previous speakers and, and you know, pointed out, uh, you know, something that works in, you know, uh, certain parts of the world may not work in others. So we need to collaboratively uh, uh, build uh, on these studies uh, and, and move towards that. And, you know, I'd, I'd throw in this concept, which, you know, what Dr. Robin really had pointed out is these global digital health goods, right? If we can have uh, some of these services available, I think we will start to see that pick up just as we've seen uh, multiple times in the open source industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Rabin, do you want to quickly say something or do you want us to go ahead? Oh, why don't you keep Sorry. going? Yeah. Excellent. Um, so, so the next set of questions speak to governance issues, right? So the first one is about cost effectiveness, second is about governance and different questions from different angles, which, which are really very interesting. So Helen Schneider um, talked about how, to what extent should we rely on Silicon Valley, um, big technological companies, um, where regulatory control and data ownership is not in the hands of individual countries, even less individual users. That's a question about how do you govern that process. Um, another question from Sana Contractor, um, who's reflecting on the situation in India, um, was talking about uh, are there examples from countries where there have been legislative controls or regulatory controls that have worked really well um, in, in governing these technologies? Uh, give the example of the of the new data national data initiative in India and the kinds of problems that, that are clearly going to pop up. The third question again in this basket uh, is from Tim Martini, who um, is wondering whether health worker unions have been involved, if there are examples of the involvement of health worker unions in planning the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, and again, another question from Badarayan Srinivasan um, is asking whether it's possible for us in the health system research community to play a role in holding its corporate interests um, accountable. So again, back to you, whoever wants to start, Robin perhaps, um, I'll start with only just a small fraction of that because uh, there was a lot in those questions. Uh, but I will just say that that I think uh, governance is around this is very new and it is a field that we are really only just uh, approaching and figuring out. Uh, so I am part of a WHO group that is looking at ethics and governance in the use of AI in health uh, because while there are lots of um, frameworks around ethics and governance for AI in general, uh, there has been very little that's been worked up specifically for health and there are some specific features and, and concerns in health that are different from, from some of the other areas where AI is being used. And so that group is um, uh, about to hopefully release a consultation document around what we think the key principles are for ethics. Uh, and when it comes to governance, um, we're trying to put together some checklists, uh, three checklists, one for developers, one for ministries of health and one for health providers around things that you would need to consider uh, before you decide to use a particular AI in your country. And so I think, you know, this is just a really new field and we're still trying to get to grips with how to do governance well. And yes, you will always be bound by uh, your country's, you know, rules around the use of data and privacy and confidentiality and so forth. But then there's just this added layer uh, of, of difficulty when it comes to AI. Uh, and that includes uh, con considering things like the transparency of, of the AI. Do you understand, you know, what is in the black box and do you understand what data it has been trained on uh, and do you understand you know how it has been tested in your population and then um, um, several other things like accountability where will, where does the accountability lie if we're using an AI for for example clinical diagnosis so uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll have a few more answers for people but I'll, I'll let everyone else have a go at this one too. Pratap you want to join in uh, jump in thank you Robin. Uh, yeah, um, I think um, the one point I'd like to make, which I made briefly in my talk as well, is that the better governance is going to come with more local actors. Right? The more local actors you have, the local entrepreneurs, the local technologists, the local healthcare providers, and the local uh, um, 
governance and government uh, agencies or oversight, uh, the better it's going to be for everyone. And it starts with the data, right? So we want to generate local data. Uh, and yes, regulation it's, tends to focus on safeguarding the use of, um, use of AI and not so much the development. So this, it's still very early days in how these AI um, are going to be developed for local problems. But I can't stress uh, enough that uh, the more local actors you have in the whole spectrum of AI, from the generation of data to developing algorithms to its use, the better governance is going to be. And I'm gonna jump in uh, and just say also that uh, there, there's always going to be this tension, right? Because as innovators, and innovation does not necessarily, uh, uh, cannot be constrained or confined with all these rules and regulations or whatnot, right? Uh, uh, you know, because as more, you know, rules and, and you know, governance, if you will, that we put, uh, innovation is going to be strangled. But however, uh, what, I, what I'll argue, uh, and building on, you know, uh, previous speakers' comments, uh, I think having safe havens and, you know, transparent sandboxes, right, where people and the local developers can come in and say, here's what we're doing, here's what we're trying to achieve, and this is what, you know, how we're going about doing this. I think having that local transparent dialogue uh, could be the solution, but there's always going to be that tension, right, between trying to govern too much or letting uh, things loose and thinking outside the box. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I would, uh, if I may come in there, I thought I would agree with uh, those points, all of those uh, points, and uh, that uh, particularly around local, involving the local community uh, of developers and local systems, because we have seen an imposition of AI from uh, rich Western countries. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, uh, research and development and uh, supposed help, which has actually been a disguise for lots of data mining in countries where governance perhaps is not as strong as it is elsewhere. And this is quite exploitative. So avoiding that data colonialism uh, in AI and actually getting engagement uh, so that people, local people uh, have more, not only control, but also that they can develop the tools that are most likely to be useful. I think it's absolutely critical. One, only one other point on governance I would mention is that the struggle everybody's having, no matter how rich your country is, is workforce. Uh, actually, the human beings required to do the due diligence and the, the governance of the, uh, of the data and the AI is just not enough. It's tiny. We need a lot more uh, innovation in how we actually distribute this task. Thank you very much. Um, the next set of questions, we have only eight, nine minutes left. So the next set of questions um, are about trust. Uh, sort of the kind of unintended consequences in relation to trust. So, uh, and they've come from a range of people, Asha George, Eleanor Wiley, Leanne Brady, so Kashana Nandi, and, and the, one of them is about trust with how we train our workers. So the distance that technologies create between those who are doing the training and those who are conducting the training, for example, um, how, how, how do we think about trust in that space? And I'm looking to Pratap because I'm sure he has experience in that. The second um, issue around trust has to do with how, how trust uh, is reconfigured in, in the patient-provider relationship. So the, the provider says to the patient, well, I'm using AI to tell me what to do. How, how, how do you think about trust in that, in that kind of space? And the third trust question is a bit of also a governance question, which is that a lot of the researchers who are working in this space are also funded by industry. How do we think about the trust we should have in what they say, um, given their potential conflict of interest? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, since you named me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and take a stab at this. Um, uh, again, trying to keep it simple, I guess trust uh, goes very closely with transparency. So the more transparency you have in how you're developing and uh, using this AI, there's going to be more trust. So when we use computer vision technologies um, with healthcare providers uh, in Kenya, uh, the feedback, so it's a, it is some way a design, uh, a design issue. How can you make what's happening, the magic that's happening in the background as easy to understand in the front for the users involved? 
And so there is a large amount of effort needed in the design of these technologies uh, and the transparency in how it's going to be used. Uh, so maybe I'll stop at that because there's not much time left. Uh, so uh, mm -hmm. the others. Yeah, thank you. Who else wants to pick up on the trust questions? I, I maybe just pop in very briefly to say that there may be slightly different uh, issues around trust when it comes to your doctor or your um, community health uh, worker using a tool that is just is just a tool to help them do their job. There's a, there are different trust uh, issues connected with that to some of the other types of uh, uses of AI, which might involve big data. It might involve predictions that are very precise about particular racial groups, for example, or particular migrant groups. Uh, and this can raise all sorts of uh, challenges to do with uh, discrimination that many of those groups may have faced before. So naturally people might become more resistant to some black box technology that is maybe saying things about their group that may have negative consequences. And that's, so I would really just caution that there are differences between very practical bits of technology to help you do your job and some of these other uses. And it's, it does still come back to the relationship, as, as Eric Topol said, you know, the, you, one of the questions was about the patient-clinician relationship, and that is still a, at the heart of this. And it is still always, a, the way that we, you know, mostly use AI, there's still a person in the loop, there's still a clinician who is making the ultimate decision about whether to rely on what that AI is telling them or not. And there's, there's a still having the the uh, relationship with their patient so it, it all comes back to that really to me that there is um, there is no reason why AI should destroy the trust in that relationship uh, I don't know many doctors who will really tell their patients currently how they make decisions around what they do if they're you know are they really very forthcoming and honest about you know the fact that we make some decisions based on the last you know, five patients that I saw with this, but actually I've only seen one patient that looks like you. And, and I also use a, something like a framing and, you know, um, equation, which was based on a few thousand North American men, uh, white men. Uh, so, so, you know, I don't think that it uh, necessarily immediately is going to destroy that relationship. I think that is still very much up to the personal relationships involved. Uh, and, 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 you know, very, very briefly also, you know, looking at this, I think, you know, as consumers, uh, generally speaking, we trust, you know, for example, Google to tell us, hey, it's time to leave home for you to get to a meeting. I think it also depends on the stakes, right? So if the, if the tool or the technology is telling me, hey, Dari, maybe you need to sleep in a little bit more or wake up uh, or walk. I think we will be more acceptant of that, right? To trust these uh, tools or listen to them at least. But if these tools are telling us, uh, Dari, you know, in, in like two years time, you're going to develop diabetes or God forbid, in, in certain circumstances, like, you know, we're going to decide this person lives or this person dies. I think it really depends on the stakes and how we're going to interpret, uh, if you will, these results and, you know, sort of internalize them, whether we accept them or not. But I think it is with time and depending on the stake, I think uh, this is where uh, we either trust or not trust the technology. Thanks. Thank you. We have two more minutes, but, but it, it, in one minute, I will try to also acknowledge some other questions that I think are very important to talk about. Um, so one from Asha George and another from Binta Adikari. Uh, and they're both speaking to the future or to what else we might be doing with, with AI. So for example, Asha was talking about how, how we might use AI to, to streamline management systems, finance systems, to monitor finance flows, and perhaps the consequences of that for accountability, for corruption, etc. And Binta also mentioned, um, interestingly, how we might think of using AI to solve political problems, right? Um, so for example, to influence um, political discourse around unresolved global health issues in, in, in the community, which is another interesting way to think about it. Um, and two um, additional comments uh, about um, what we need to do in the future. So George Gottstadt talked about the need for us to start thinking about how to study the ethical consequences. So not just the ethical consequences, but how to study them in, in research. And um, Emmanuel Monser um, mentioned the need to start compiling um, various international health policies around artificial intelligence to have some sort of database which is again, another interesting thing. I hope someone is doing it. If not, someone should be doing it. 
Um, but yeah, so just wrapping up with, with those interesting insights from, from the Q&A platform, um, I should uh, give you uh, 15 seconds each to say one thing round before we end. So again, I'm going to go to Robin first. Uh, just uh, e echo that last point, I think it was from Asha, about there's lots of other things we could do with AI that are not clinical that would really, really help our health services. And let's try and get people excited about doing that as well, because it's quite hard to do. Yep. Great. Pratap? Um, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a lot can be done, but I, uh, uh, my uh, uh, message always is there's not enough being done at least not enough being done locally. So the more we do, the more we will learn. So yes, we need to do the research around it, but we need to do more for us to do better research. So let's let's invest in the doing, uh, the data that uh, comes out, the use of that data, the application of those algorithms and so on. Let's do more and uh, the rest will follow. Thank you, Dari. Uh, so let's do more. Let's think of the tools or, or how we can leverage these technologies in other uh, areas, not only in clinical care, but also bring everybody to that one table and on the same level. Thank you. Claudia? Um, I would uh, agree uh, with the point about utilizing these technologies for administrative purposes. They often are undervalued in health informatics, and yet they have capacity to make the biggest financial difference to organizations. We and, and also are generally less ethically problematic. And, and therefore, I think this is a real important area. But also, I think just as we've cautioned about the, uh, the ethical risks uh, and governance challenges of data and AI, we also, as has been pointed out, need to look for the potential for uh, these technologies to enable good governance in systems by uh, flagging in, in, in illegitimate practices that are problematic, uh, extending some of the, uh, uh, the benefits that have been seen in other types of information system which produ produce greater transparency um, and, um, and accountability. Thank you very much um, to all of you once again, and thanks to Eric who gave the keynote, and 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 thanks for the, for the participants who sent in very very interesting and important and interesting questions.